This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. There's no community in our state that isn't impacted by domestic violence. In February, a mother and son were shot dead in a double murder suicide in Brooklyn, Connecticut. A Milford woman was found dead in December after being attacked by the father of her three year old child. Before the attack, she had pleaded with law enforcement to do more to protect her and her children. Today, we'll hear from the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence and learn about statewide efforts to reduce domestic violence. We'll also learn about teen dating violence and how it can be prevented. Intimate partner violence doesn't always mean physical and sexual abuse. Connecticut recently passed a law on coercive control, allowing people experiencing psychological abuse and other non physical forms of abuse to file a restraining order. We'll find out more about that law later in the show. And just a quick note, we will be discussing adult themes like intimate partner violence. This show may not be appropriate for young listeners. And joining me now is Megan Scanlon. She's the CEO of the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Barbara Damon. She's the president and CEO of Prudence Crandall Center. Thank you both of us for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Yes, our pleasure. You can also join the conversation, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Uh, Megan, I want to start with you. Can you give us a status update on domestic violence deaths here in Connecticut? We've seen a number of them happen. We mentioned a couple of them at the top of the hour. Are deaths on the rise? So Connecticut does average about 14 intimate partner um, homicides a year. Um, I would say we're actually, uh, on average, um, given the last two years uh, data, we had 16 um, in 21 and then um, 12 in, in just wrapping up this past year. Uh, so we we are still about average in terms of our average uh, homicide rate. Obviously, one is too many. Um, but we have seen over the last couple of years that even um, outside of the homicides, but certainly with respect to the homicides, uh, that there has been an increased level of violence and lethality. So meaning that the um, the acts that are happening, um, whether physical or whether um, emotional, whether verbally um, through texting or through um, communications have been uh, more disturbing. And that's certainly something we've seen over the last several years here in the state. Well, and then you mentioned lethality. Can you explain what exactly does that mean to our listeners? Sure. It's uh, essentially the the level of um, violence in a situation. So obviously, you know, you'd referenced the December um, murder in in Milford. I mean that that was an axe. Um, that's typically uh, that's that's not typical for what we see in terms of uh, intimate partner homicide. Most of the homicides that we've seen in the state have been with firearms, but obviously an axe or other, um, you know, knife or, or something like that is, is really personal when it, when it comes down to it. Um, and certainly, um, very disturbing. And we've seen obviously threats of use of these types of weapons and firearms, um, being communicated through, um, texting and through, um, open communication with, with partners, with amongst partners. So we've definitely seen a rise of that. We've also seen a rise in the the lethality around children, um, what they've witnessed, but then also them being subject to and often, um, unfortunately, victims of of these homicide situations, whether they be murder suicides or um, or otherwise. And so just to clarify, we're not seeing more deaths per se, but we're seeing more violent incidences of dom- domestic violence. Is that correct? Yes. And Barbara, I want to bring you into this too. You know, can you respond to what Megan just said? And is this also something that you're seeing? Yes, thank you. Um, you know, I, I think the the um, for the um, viewers to understand that we're, what we're also talking about is the severity of the abuse. And um, as Megan mentioned, you know, that heightened lethality or risk of of death, risk of murder um, is really what we're talking about. And so often um, that presents itself by way of, of 
threats and intimidation and strangulation. Um, you know, seeing an increase in strangulation being used as a means of abuse and intimidation and control, um, as well as the, you know, the excessive texting, the excessive controlling behaviors on the part of the abusers that um, that are part of the dynamic. And we'll get into more of the details of that, too, later on. And we want to talk about, though, now, clarifying that although deaths are not on the rise, we are seeing a larger number of murder-suicides in our state, including the cases we mentioned earlier. And according to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, 72% of all murder-suicides involve an intimate partner, while 94% of the victims of these murder-suicides are female. Uh, Barbara, can you help us unpack these scenarios? Are those numbers surprising to you? Um, disturbing, yes. Surprising, no. Um, you know, I think that the reality is that um, people live in situations that um, from the outside, you can't always tell what's going on behind closed doors or how dangerous a situation might be. Um, and we know that when there's the presence of firearms, um, when there are a number of other factors um, related to previous abuse, um, controlling behaviors that, um, you know, we're going to see an incident of domestic violence that um, reaches law enforcement's attention. Megan, I want to turn that question to you, too. You know, 72 percent of all murder-suicides involve an intimate partner, while 94 percent of the victims are female. Is that surprising to you? Can you break that break that down for us as well? Yeah, I mean, I certainly would echo what Barbara said in terms of it's disturbing, but not surprising, right? Um, you know, a majority of the individuals that we serve across the state identify as women. And it's not to say we don't serve others, including men, those that identify as men. Um, so I don't think that statistic is surprising, unfortunately. And I think um, when you think about domestic violence, the, the biggest part of domestic violence is that power and control dynamic. So murder-suicide is sort of the ultimate power and control act in, you know, if you think about somebody has decided that they are worthy of taking another person's life, that, that they have the ability to do that. Um, and if they cannot have that person then that person does not deserve um, to be living. I mean, I think that is, uh, that's where that ultimate act comes from. And, and oftentimes there is mental illness involved, right? Um, and there is that dynamic that uh, Barbara kind of alluded to firearms, but there's mental health, there's financial strains, there's um, other things that impact the the dynamic between two, two people in a household. Um, but that, unfortunately, I think is the ultimate act of power and control. And when that happens, Barbara, you know, a lot of people seek out um, safer places to be. Can you give us an update on what things are looking like in the shelters? You know, we have been through a period um, during the pandemic and, and now as we're coming out of that time um, when there has been an elevated um, need for services. We have at Prudence Crandall Center seen more people coming forward and seeking our help than ever before in our nearly 50 years of providing services. Um, and, uh, you know, it continues to be at a high level. Um, and we, you know, as a service delivery system and as an agency, um, we have been on overflow for a very long time. And that means that our 22-bed emergency shelter is full. Our additional overflow spaces that we're making work um, are full. And we are having to use hotel rooms um, to respond to the folks who are coming forward and saying they're experiencing domestic violence and they're not safe. And Megan, your organization is working on a number of policy areas this year. Can you share with us about those advocacy efforts that you're focusing on? Sure. I think the biggest one is um, is around funding. I mean, you obviously just heard Barbara talk about the fact that our shelters, you know, her shelter um, is not unique across the state. Unfortunately, all of our, our shelters are feeling the pressure of trying to meet the need that is is growing. I think 
in in two ways. I think one, there's more awareness, which is great. We've been really trying to normalize this conversation um, and and reduce the stigma. So I think that's that's definitely part of it. But then the other part of it is um, is just that that level of uh, threat, intimidation, and, and violence that's happening in the homes across the state. So, um, so first and foremost, we are concerned about resources and funding. Um, we do have a challenge ahead of us uh, with uh, federal funding that we typically have seen come into the state of Connecticut through the Victims of Crime Act, um, which is non-taxpayer uh, revenue that comes traditionally through prosecution of white collar crime at the federal level. Um, this is a nationwide issue, but Connecticut is going to see a 50% reduction to that funding. So we have gone um, to the state and, and kudos to the governor for putting in his fiscal 24 budget, the gap that we need in order to remain whole. Um, but we know this is a long-term issue and it's a long-term problem for um, victim services in the state of Connecticut. And so we really are working closely with the legislature to try to solve this problem um, long-term uh, work with them on a sustainable source of revenue through the state um, to prioritize victim services like domestic violence. So that's that's first and foremost, uh, because we can't do the work that we need to do unless we have the resources and the staffing and the supports in order to help individuals across the state that come to us uh, in great need. And then we have other initiatives around um, a public health initiative that we're very excited about. So trying to raise awareness, meet people where they are in the community. We worked with the Connecticut Hospital Association to um, essentially get a bill into the public health committee that would um, require all birthing hospitals um, to distribute information around intimate partner violence and the resources that are out there in order to help those individuals. Because what we've seen through sitting on the maternal mortality review committee for the state of Connecticut is that there is an increased risk of um, of death around postpart pregnant and postpartum women um, in the state. And we are doing what we can to address that issue. And I think this is a really good first step so that anybody that is getting discharged after having a baby will get that information. It does not raise any red flags if you are there with your abuser. Um, and it's really starting the conversation with healthcare professionals around training as well. Um, training for them in order to be able to better assist their patients. Well, you mentioned that Governor Nelamon has allocated money uh, towards the, the funding that you were mentioning, and I think he actually put in $13 million to domestic violence resources. Um, can you share with us, you know, where does that go? Is it a temporary fix for making sure that these resources remain available? Is it towards long-term? You know, help us understand that. Sure. Sure. So, Go ahead, oh, Megan. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so I just want to be clear, it's 13 million is not going toward domestic violence um, services. It's actually all of the services, victim services in the state of Connecticut. Um, so we are one of um, one of several organizations that receives some money out of that 13 million. Um, so, you know, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, Victims of Homicide, um, uh, the Alliance for Sexual um, violence, uh, CCADV is one of those individuals, um, individual recipients, and it is a short-term fix. It's it's temporary. It's one-time funding, um, but we know that this problem is a, essentially going to live with us for the rest of of the time that we are um, providing services because at the federal level, that fund is never going to get to where it was. So I think it provides a really good opportunity to work with our partners ar across the state agencies and the legislature to talk about what does funding victim services look like in the state of Connecticut? Because there are certainly models um, in our neighboring states, New York um, and others that um, prioritize victim services within the state budget on a much more regular um, and sustainable basis. And Barbara, go ahead if you want to respond. Yes, yes, thank you. And I um, I appreciate um, all of what Megan is sharing and, and the advocacy efforts that CCADV leads um, alongside all of the 18 domestic violence programs and Prudence Crandall Center, you know, advocating for those 
um, changes in those important resources. And I, you know, I think just to, to bring it to a personal level, um, when we think about the, the funding that comes through that Victims of Crime Act to the domestic violence service delivery system, um, this is making sure that people who experience domestic violence, when there's an arrest in their living room the night before, the next morning, there's going to be an arraignment in court um, and the victim is going to be reached out to by a certified domestic violence counselor, one of our family violence advocates who is trained to know how to respond in that moment and make sure that victims know what their rights are, what the process is going to look like, their opportunity for input, um, and make sure that we can reach out to them and, and offer resources and safety in that moment. We see time and again the abuser using the court system and those processes as part of that fear and intimidation and controlling tactic. Um, and so to be in that moment and be uncertain about what's going to happen next or what your rights are is an incredibly intimidating and scary thing to experience. Um, so it's so important that these resources are made available so that we can continue to provide that level of service for people in that most vulnerable time when they really need to be supported to make sure that they have the, the relief that's available to them through the legal system. Well, and as we continue to talk about the legal system and policy, uh, two sessions ago, Connecticut lawmakers passed laws around coercive control. Uh, Barbara, can you remind our listeners what does that look like and what does it mean? So as Megan mentioned, you know, the dynamics of domestic violence, um, I think people often think that, you know, domestic violence is, a, is an anger management issue, right? That it's somebody who blows up one time and, and punches somebody or, you know, something like that. And the reality is that domestic violence is a pattern of behavior that is used to intimidate and control another person. And sometimes that involves physical violence, um, but it almost always involves emotional abuse and put downs and those things that are referred to as coercive control, that non-physical abuse that um, limits their ability to move forward, limits their ability to work, to um, access their finances, access um, the services and support of their family members through that controlling behavior and that increasing isolation that often results. And um, that's the that was the impetus of of bringing that to the forefront and saying, you know, this is just as much an issue and a concern as the physical violence and the threat of physical violence. And when the threat of the violence gets to law enforcement, you know, Barbara, how what are your thoughts about how Connecticut law enforcement can do better? There's a lot of debate out there on whether or not arrests for domestic violence will deter future abuse or create a retaliatory backlash. You know, what are your thoughts on that? You know, I think as a as a service delivery system overall, we have an amazing relationship and partnership with law enforcement agencies um, at the state level, as well as um, each of us, each individual program um, connecting to the law enforcement agencies within the catchment area that we serve. Um, we're able to connect with them and provide training. Um, Megan can talk about the Lethality Assessment Project, um, which is a partnership with all of the police departments to make sure that um, in that moment when there is an arrest being made, that the victim is connected to services. Um, can we do better? Can they do better? Absolutely. Um, there's always room for improvement and I think um, you know, there's there's variations, right? There are some law enforcement officers who are doing a really wonderful job, and there are others who need more training. Um, so I think the work continues, and it's an important focus for us. Well, Megan, I was already going to ask you to respond, but now Barbara yeah. has mentioned the assessment project. Can you share with us more about that? Yeah, so I do want to go back a little bit, though, to the um, coercive control, because and it, I think it ties into basically the the systems that are at work when um, an individual is impacted by domestic violence. So I think it's really important for listeners to understand that there are so many systems that interact with each other. Um, you know, obviously the court system is one of them. And I think 
Um, one of the things we know about non-physical um, forms of abuse is that it can eventually lead to physical. Um, but what we also knew in making that law was that the court, the courts had seen coercive control happen in um, in their proceedings in the past, but there was no remedy before this law where judges could put something in place um, to make people safer. So um, I do think it was, you know, an incredible um, partnership across systems to get that law passed and um, to have it be uh, used in order to keep people safe. So I just wanted to touch on that really quickly. Um, and then in terms of law enforcement, um, you know, we have a director of law enforcement services at CCDV that works with every um, every department, uh, including the state police, around best practices um, when responding to um, a domestic violence incident, um, and then best practices, you know, in terms of follow up, making sure they get connected to resources. And as Barbara said, we do have a, a good working relationship with most of the departments. Um, you know, I think overall systems are always looking to improve. Um, all systems have um, their issues. Um, but I also think we are asking law enforcement in many regards to do a lot of things outside of what they would say their scope is. So they, I think, would say to you, I am there for probable cause of did this domestic violence incident happen? Um, and that is their like first singular focus. I think we're obviously asking them to kind of step outside and be the social workers in some ways, which I think is problematic because that is not something they're trained in. Um, so I obviously kudos to the departments that have hired social workers um, to go out or um, to follow up with individuals. And some, some departments do have a liaison from our domestic violence service providers within embedded within their departments. Um, but to Barbara's point, yeah, we can always do better. And I think this legislative session, we are trying to do that. Uh, we we there is a bill in the Judiciary Committee that would set up a um, statewide council that would bring all of these different systems together. We've often worked in silos um, around these issues. Um, so it would bring probation, law enforcement, chief state's attorney's office, um, you know, court support services. It would bring in, um, you know, obviously, the advocates um, to the work so that we all get around the table and we can look at some of these bigger issues around GPS expansion, around DV dockets, around um, response to restraining and protective orders. So I think that could be a really good way to move forward um, and work with our partners across the state. And then obviously the, the lethality assessment tool is something that um, the departments are all um, trained on. It's a series of questions that when, when law enforcement responds to an incident, which by the way is the most lethal incident they can respond to. So they are certainly putting themselves at risk every time they go to one of these calls. If a if an individual answers um, questions um, and screen that they screen high um, based on the response to some of the to the questions, they're automatically um, they're automatically connected to domestic violence services in their region. Um, so that's something we are really proud of. It's a completely voluntary. We have 100% participation in that program across the state. It's not state mandated. Um, and it's served as a model for other states um, across our country as well. Um, so that is a tool. Not every victim wants to respond, obviously, um, in that moment. But for the individuals that that do and that have, um, it's really been a lifeline to get them connected to services. You've been hearing That's from me. Oh. I'm sorry, Catherine. Go ahead. No, I was gonna, we're, I was going to end the segment, but go ahead and um, finish your thought. Yeah, I was just going to say absolutely agree, Megan, and and I think you know for for that moment when there is a domestic violence situation happening and an arrest is being made, to be able to have the victim pulled aside, ask these questions, assess the danger level, and if they're willing, be connected right in that moment to one of our um, staff um, on the hotline in the middle of the night, and to hear from them that we're here for them. 
there's help available. And even if they're not ready to accept it or seek it right now, they know that we're a resource in the future. And that's just such an important component of that project. And just to add to that, for our listeners, if you need help or just someone to talk to, please li- please visit ctsafeconnect.org or call or text 888-774-2900. Advocates are available 24-7. Uh, you've been listening to Megan Scanlon. She's the CEO of the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Barbara Damon, who's the president and CEO of the Prudence Crandall Center. They will both be staying with us to talk about the long-term health impacts caused by domestic violence. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. Today, we're talking about domestic violence. In the last segment, we talked about how the number of domestic violence cases in Connecticut hasn't risen in recent years, but the cases are becoming more violent and potentially lethal. Here to talk about how those traumatic experiences can impact children and their own intimate partnerships in the future is Megan Scanlon. She's the CEO of the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Barbara Damon, who is the CEO of Prudence Crandall Center. And just a note, because of the nature of this topic, you may want to listen to the podcast later if you have children around. Uh, Barbara, I want to jump straight in with you. Um, In February, we talked about a mother and son were shot dead um, in a double murder-suicide in Brooklyn, Connecticut. Can you talk about how witnessing domestic violence impacts children as they grow up and how does that impact their intimate partnerships as they grow older? You know, this is such a challenging topic because we know that children, uh, children learn what they live and um, it just underlines the importance of intervention in families where domestic violence is happening and the services that we're able to offer at Prudence Crandall Center, as well as at all the domestic violence programs across the state geared toward the needs of children. Because the reality for them is when there is abuse in the home, they are absolutely impacted and it can have health consequences for them into the future. And Um, emotional consequences. It can affect their educational performance in the future. Um, They can develop things like, you know, problems sleeping, um, difficulty concentrating, which can impact school performance, increased aggression and anxiety. Um, And it can lead to issues in the future if it's not addressed um, that, you know, can can add to is Um, possibility of them becoming uh, substance misusers, um, having alcohol issues, um, juvenile delinquency, just all kinds of things that um, are preventable if we can intervene now and get folks the services that they need and reach out to these smallest victims. And I think related to that, uh, Megan, according to a recent White House briefing, they said each year around 12 percent of American high schoolers experience physical or sexual viol- violence at the hands of an intimate partner. And dating violence can also occur on social media, online and through other electronic communications in the form of cyber stalking, non-consensual distributions of intimate images and other technology facilitated harms. Can you talk more about teen dating violence and how this can impact young young adults long term? Yeah, I mean, I think this is this is something that, you know, I personally am very passionate about. I think, as Barbara stated, you know, a lot of the reasons why um, this issue is so crucial is that this is preventable. So at the child level, right, like they are in these situations and have often zero control. Um, So I think. At, at the outset, like we have an obligation as an entire society to do better um, for them. And then as obviously they grow up, um, if they have learned that this is, you know, love, um, that these behaviors around um, intimidation, fear, um, emotional uh, and psychological abuse are, are love, then when they become um, teenagers, 
Um, these are the examples they have, right? So they often find themselves in situations um, that are essentially um, similar to what they experienced as a child. Um, and then there's obviously individuals that that find themselves in that situation that maybe didn't have that experience that don't know how to name this. Um, so, and I think the biggest thing that we're seeing is technology influencing teen dating violence. Um, what you spoke about, sort of the social media, the texting, the sharing of videos. Um, there is no way of getting away, you know, so to speak, from um, the individual that is trying to exert this control over you as um, as a teenager. So um, what I encourage individuals that are, are dealing with this, teenagers that are dealing with this, is, is find somebody to talk to that you trust um, in order to try to navigate the situation. Because what we do know is that if you are experiencing this as a teenager, you know, the likelihood of you um, going into your adult years experiencing it does increase. Um, and we want to try to avoid that. Uh, it does impact women um, or young girls, especially girls of color at a higher rate. Um, so we know that we need to address that and why that is happening within um, obviously the state of Connecticut, but then nationwide. Uh, so I think there's some things that we can do. Our domestic violence service providers have family child advocates on staff. Um, they have community educators on staff that go into the school systems and try to educate um, kids around healthy relationships and what is a healthy relationship versus what is an unhealthy relationship. They are certainly there to help kids navigate um, situations that they are finding themselves in, in a, in a non-judgmental, very confidential way. Uh, so I encourage parents, kids, educators, um, anybody that is dealing with children to please get to know your local domestic violence service provider because there are so many resources um, that they can take advantage of in order to help prevent this from generationally continuing. Well, in both yeah, make it oh, go for it, Barbara. I, I would love to to second that and to jump in with some very specific examples with, um, from our community educator um, that I saw just, just uh, last week. Um, we do a survey after we spend time with the teens talking about dating violence and healthy relationships and ask them what they learned and what was most impactful for them. And I just want to share a couple of those that, that are on the top of my head because I just can't get them out of my head. I think that's so, so crucial. And one response was that they learned that violence is more than blood. Um, and another one was that a lot of their friends are in toxic relationships. And then another one said that she realized she'd never been in a healthy relationship. And so when we think about how vulnerable our teenagers are um, and that, you know, statistically one in three dating teens have already experienced some sort of abuse in their relationship, um, it's really crucial that we have those community educators that are able to go in and um, provide that information so that they understand what healthy, respectful, loving relationships can be and what their rights are in a relationship um, so that we can prevent domestic violence in the future. And you know, we've been talking about families and teens, and we also know that domestic violence impacts every community. Uh, Barbara, can you talk about some of those communities that tend to be overlooked when we're having these conversations? And are there things that are being done to address those unique needs of the specific communities? Absolutely. There are barriers that all victims of domestic violence face when they consider coming forward and seeking services. Um, and I think that that's even more true for folks who are in parts of more vulnerable populations. Um, for, for example, men who are victims of domestic violence, people who, I, who identify as men, um, one in seven men statistically will be in an abusive relationship. Um, and it's one in four women. And so we know that, you know, the the shame and the humiliation that people can sometimes feel when they share the fact that this has um, been going on in their relationship and they consider coming forward for help. 
um, is even more so um, felt by a male victim of domestic violence. Um, and the same can be said for the LGBTQ plus community. Um, you know, there are additional layers of intimidation tactics, um, you know, threatening to out someone to their family or at work, um, just, you know, additional layers and barriers that can be put into place, um, as well as folks feeling as if um, it may not be safe for them to come forward. And I want to reassure everyone who's listening that all of the domestic violence service agencies across the state are all welcoming and are ready and available to um, accept and um, provide intervention and services regardless of um, ethnicity or race, race or um sexual preference or any other what feels like um, a barrier or a difference or something that might um, be um, judged. Uh, we are here to help and um, we've provided training to all of our staff to make sure that we are well positioned to help everyone who comes forward. And Barbara, Megan mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I wonder if you can expand on the long-term health impacts of domestic violence, especially uh, children witnessing them. You know, what are the ramifications of living with that trauma? Well, domestic violence truly is a public health crisis. And we know there's, there's, there's research that shows what those implications are and the physical manifestations of living with stress and trauma and witnessing abuse or being abused yourself. Um, for children, it's, you know, the concern is going into older years and the behavior problems that can um, result, the um, emotional difficulties that can result um, in depression, anxiety, more likely to um, struggle around suicide and to have PTSD um, and substance misuse. Uh, the list is endless, um, just really making folks more vulnerable to health problems that, again, are preventable if we can provide the intervention early enough and um, give folks the services that they need. And I would love to ask both of you to respond to a message we got from David in Hartford. Uh, he asks, you know, many of these policies address the attacker. Are there policies so the attacker can be forced into re-education or something to deter them from, from this mentality, such as driver's ed for driving drunk? Barbara? Um, you know, I think the answer is um, yes, there are services available for um, abusers and um, services that they can be mandated to participate in. Um, I think that the reality is that there aren't um, enough services available and um, that there are some very specific um, needs that um, and, and um, requirements that um, service providers really need to fulfill in order to provide that service well. It's a very challenging time when we think about, you know, a, a couple entering counseling or entering services together um, and um, what the ramifications are for a victim in that moment. So um, we know that there are challenges about approaching services together um, because it's not safe typically for the victim to do that. Um, so the, when we look to abusers uh, who are, you know, hopefully identifying that they have um, an issue and that they want to seek help and change their behavior, then um, you know there are services available. At the, but they are they are indeed limited across the state. And I'm sure Megan, you can um, shed some light on. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, I think the reality is to David's question, um, it's a good one. And I think we have a lot more work to do on the offender um, side of this, because the reality is, unless you are uh, going through the court system, uh, unless you have an arrest, uh, then you're not really accessing these programs. Um, uh, so I think there's, there's that. I know one of the things we do want to work on uh, through the uh, the council that I mentioned is looking at um, the programs that are currently running and if there is a way that we could um, shift that to uh, a different setup, a different best practice that 
other states have used, which is a 16 week program um, that I know our, um, our partners at Court Support Services and, and, our, and us and others are sort of looking at in terms of how do we revamp some of the, the programs that we do currently have, because I think uh, to Barbara's point, there are resources, certainly, um, they're not enough. And uh, I think it is sort of time that we sort of change some of the conversation around um, to address the fact that the offender does need to uh, change behavior, right? Um, that, that's the ultimate goal. We do believe that is possible um, as a movement, um, but we certainly uh, have to live in the reality that we are in, which is uh, change is hard. And for people to change, they certainly need more to Barbara's point than, um, you know, court mandated program. Um, they certainly need more supports, um, access to other services, um, including, you know, employment, um, you know, probably long term counseling um, and other stressors that often put an individual um, at greater risk of um, of being an offender. And I, I often say when I'm on these shows or, or even just uh, talking at meetings, I don't think anybody grows up and says, hey, I want to be a domestic violence victim or I want to be a domestic violence offender. I think, um, I think we have a lot of work to do in terms of our prevention work with children, with teens, um, in order to ensure that we are doing better generation by generation. Um, and this is certainly an area that we can improve on. Well, I want to thank David for that comment. And you've been listening to Megan Scallon. She's the CEO of the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And Barbara Damon, who's the executive director, or I'm sorry, who is the CEO of Prudence Crandall Center. We'll be back after a short break to talk about how to help when you know someone's in a dangerous partnership. And just another reminder that if you do need help or just need someone to talk to, please visit ctsafeconnect.org or call or text. 888-774-2900. Advocates are available 24-7. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. We are continuing our conversation about domestic violence and how to help when you think someone might be in a dangerous partnership. Here to help us break it down is Megan Scallon. She's the CEO of the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Barbara Damon, who's the CEO of the Prudence Crandall Center. And just another note that this show may not be appropriate for younger listeners. Uh, Barbara, I just want to ask if you know someone who is in a relationship with all of the classic warning signs, how can you help that person when they refuse to see that there's a problem and can you also talk about what are some of the classic warning signs? You know, it's a really difficult time. It can be a difficult time for family and friends to um, realize that that there are, there's something wrong going on in a relationship, that their person that they care about is being harmed in some way. Um, and um, I think the best thing that they can do is to share the hotline number, share the information that help is available, let the person know that they are there for them um, and that they will continue to be for the, there for them without judgment. Um, it's so difficult to leave an abusive relationship um, and it's hard as family and friends to understand that and to see um, what's going on and and expect the person to just just leave right why can't you just leave um and the reality is that it's not that easy um it's a combination of the intimidation and control tactics um domestic violence victims do what they can every day to keep themselves and their children safe and to make it through the day um, and they are going to be the best ones to determine what the right next step is and if and when it's safe to leave the abusive relationship because we know the minute they step out that door and make those attempts to leave the relationship to get a protection order to seek help um, that is when they are at most risk of abuse and um, those are the most lethal times 
Um, so it really has to be something that comes from each person to determine um, when that timing is right for them. And that's really hard for friends and family as we watch people suffer. Um, and, um, you know, the other part of it is that the, um, the reality often includes um, a lack of um, economic stability and the other challenges that come from stepping away from what might be a two income household, um, realizing that you're stepping away from that and going to what, you know, what's next. For people who have resources and have financial means and family supports, there are more options available to them. For people who tend to seek our services, they have very limited financial resources. Um, they may have little or no family support or, or friend support left. Um, and it is really difficult to step away into the unknown uh, and not know if they're going to end up homeless um, as a result. I'm making we got about a minute left, but would love your yeah. final thoughts on that as well. Yeah, look, I will speak from personal experience on this one. Um, I think you know your best friends uh, pretty well. And I think for individuals that might think something's going on, just trust your gut. Um, trust your gut. Try to be there for that person. Obviously, knowing that power and control is uh, part of that is isolation. So don't don't let that um isolation, um, you know, impact your ability to be there and show up for your friend or family member when you need to. I would encourage individuals to please reach out to CT Safe Connect, the hotline. It's not just for crisis. It is absolutely for friends and family to get resources as well. You can call in and talk to an advocate, get the education you need. Um, but do, you know, just be there, listen, and if and when the individual is ready, they will reach out to you and say, I am ready. And if you have done your due diligence and educated yourself on, on what uh, comes next, then you can be a great partner in their road um, to taking back their lives. But also understand, to Barbara's point, leaving is the most dangerous time. Um, so, you know, talking to your friend about safety planning, talking to your friend about some of the resources. So I think the biggest thing is show up, listen, and then educate yourself on what resources are out there across the state of Connecticut. And we can help you um, be there for, for your loved one if and when they need you. You've been listening to Megan Scallon. She's a CEO of the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Barbara Damon, who is a CEO of the Prudence Crandall Center. Thank you both so much for being with us today. Thank you, Thank you so much. And just another note for all of our listeners, if you need help or just someone to talk to, please visit ctsafeconnect.org or call or text 888-774-2900. Advocates are available 24-7. I'm Catherine Shen. Today's show is produced by Tess Terrible and Connecticut Public's Morning Edition producer Jennifer Ahrens also contributed to this program. Our technical producer is Kat Pastor. Download where we live anytime on your favorite podcast app. And thank you so much for listening.